All right. Hello. Good evening. I'm Mark Pinto here at Phoenixville Public Library. And I'd like to welcome you to tonight's Zoom presentation on Lyme and other tick-borne diseases. Uh, you may know that the month of May is National Lyme Disease Awareness Month. And we're fortunate to have with us tonight Doug Fern from LymeBasics.org. They're a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the lives of people suffering from Lyme and other tick-borne diseases, as well as their caregivers. So Doug, welcome. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, before we get to you, Doug, uh, just a reminder, type any questions that you have during Doug's presentation into the chat, uh, or if you want to wait until the end to do so, at the end of the presentation, you can do it then or unmute yourself at the very end. So go ahead, Doug, take it away. Okay, thank you, Mark, and thank everybody who I can't see, but I presume are there. <laughs> the, one of the downsides of a virtual meeting, but thank you for coming. This is a really important topic for, for many of us, and uh, we're going to cover a lot of information here and it'll go pretty fast. Uh, so let's start out by talking about what is Lyme disease. Well, first of all, it's a bacterial infection and it's contracted from the bite of an infected deer tick. And in these photos, you can see uh, some different uh, deer ticks at different life stages. So you can see that they're very small. There's maybe other modes of transmission, other ways you can get Lyme. We know that other ticks like the dog tick and the Lone Star tick also carry this infection. The research hasn't been done to determine whether you can get it from those other ticks or not, but we presume it's likely. We also know that other insects such as mosquitoes, fleas, lice, biting flies, all carry this disease. And can they transmit it to you? We don't know. Again, the research hasn't been done, but there's lots of people who believe that they got Lyme disease from a mosquito bite. So we don't know for sure. We can't say that happens, but it appears to be possible. We know that other tick-borne diseases can be acquired through a blood transfusion. Lyme hasn't been documented to do that, but it, Many people suspect that it's possible. We know that an infected mother can pass on the infection to an unborn baby. And we also know that uh, the breast milk for, uh, for feeding an infant also contains this bacteria. And there's lots of reports of, of infants getting Lyme disease uh, from nursing. So this is, what we're talking about when we talk about the bacteria. This is a highly magnified view of the Lyme disease bacteria. It's called Borrelia burgdorferi, and it's a spirochete. It's in that class of bacteria. And it's called a spirochete because of its spiral shape. You can see they look like little corkscrews. And it's those, uh, that corkscrew, corkscrew shape that allows the bacteria to tunnel into your blood vessels and into tissues throughout your body, which is, is why this bacteria is so good at disseminating throughout your body and infecting many different areas. So because of that, it can affect any part or system of your body. We know that it's largely a neurological disease it can affect your senses, such as vis vision, hearing, taste, smell, touch, it can cause hallucinations in any of those senses. We know that it can also affect the neurological motor um, motion. So the various movement disorders, similar to Parkinson's disease or ALS, uh, you know, can cause very similar effects. We know it can affect your brain and cause cognitive problems, which could be short or long-term memory problems, brain fog. You hear a lot about brain fog with the COVID, COVID epidemic, and uh, that's certainly the case with, with Lyme for decades now. It can cause word-finding problems, difficulty functioning in the world, and a lack of concentration. As you can imagine, that can be pretty devastating 
to, to kids in school. And it can also be pretty dramatic for adults in their workplace if they can't keep up and they can't work at their normal level. It can also cause seizures. About one in 20 Lyme patients will suffer from at least one seizure during their illness. And it can cause all kinds of psychological problems, which could range from simply a moodiness that's uncharacteristic to a, a personality change where the person becomes uh, a different person than the, you know, the people around them are used to experiencing. It can cause attention deficit disorder in children. We usually think of it as a ch children uh, malady, but it can also affect adults. And rage, this is a really interesting one because so many Lyme patients that I've talked to have told me how just out of the blue, they just became outraged at something. It could be road rage, it could be outrage at, at some minor slight or at a family member. And after the episode was over, they were appalled because that was not them. And it's not them, it's this disease affecting their brain. And it can cause depression. And unfortunately, depression can be very serious. And we know that there are probably 10,000 uh, suicides a, per year in Lyme patients. And uh, so th this can be really serious effect on people. It can cause psychosis, you know, people end up being in mental institutions because of their Lyme disease. Not real common, but it happens. It can cause panic attacks. Those are pretty common. People just, for whatever reason, suddenly just feel extremely anxious and unable to function. And it can cause dementia. We know that the Lyme bacteria is closely related to the bacteria that causes syphilis. And syphilis, of course, ultimately results in a type of dementia. And it can cause arthritic problems, swollen or sore joints anywhere in your body. It can cause cardiac problems, inflammation of the heart or blood vessels, heart arrhythmias, heart block. It's even in death. We know at least a couple thousand people a year have diagnosed cardiac arrest that turns out to be fatal. And general well-being. Lyme patients often, their biggest complaint is extreme fatigue. They just can't get up out of bed in the morning. And even if they do, by early afternoon, mid-afternoon, their day is done. They can no longer keep going because of the extreme fatigue they suffer. It can cause headaches, swelling glands, unexplained fevers, the symptoms tend to change quickly. You could get up in the morning, your knee is so sore you can hardly walk. And yet by lunchtime, it's like it never happened. A true injury to your knee, of course, wouldn't heal up in a few hours, but that's a typical kind of thing that Lyme patients experience. So how prevalent is this disease? Is this something we have to worry about? Rare disease, common disease? Let's take a look at the numbers. First of all, if we look at a map from the CDC that shows where Lyme disease cases are reported, you'll notice one thing right off, and that is you can't even see the outline of Pennsylvania. It's completely obliterated by all these dots. And the northeastern part of the United States has the highest concentration of Lyme disease. This map is a little misleading because it would lead you to believe that Lyme disease is pretty rare in the rest of the country. The upper Midwest tends to have a lot of cases, but there's Lyme diseases in every state. And some states that look like they're relatively free of Lyme disease, like Oklahoma, actually have quite a large number of people that are affected. So no matter where you are in the country, Lyme disease exists but where we are in this part of the country is probably the worst. So let's look at the actual statistics reported by the CDC. 
This is for 2017. In the United States, there were almost 60,000 cases reported. The interesting thing about these numbers, if we look at Pennsylvania, it had almost 12,000 of those cases. It had 20% of all the cases reported in the US. In fact, for many, many years, Pennsylvania has the largest number of Lyme cases in the country. New York and New Jersey both have quite a few uh, as well, uh, but Pennsylvania is way out ahead. Part of that is reporting anomalies because Pennsylvania is very good about reporting their cases. A lot of other states are not. Some, case, some states have decided not to report at all. So they show zero cases when in fact there could be many, many cases there. The CDC's own research indicates that the actual number of cases is about 470,000 new cases each year, year after year. So the, the reported numbers are quite small compared to what the actual numbers probably are. 3.4 million tests for Lyme disease are ordered each year. So we know that there's been at least 3.4 million times that a doctor sat with a patient and said, this looks like Lyme disease, let's run a test on you and see. So that's an awful lot of people that are getting sick. Other estimates uh, say that probably a million or more people uh, are affected each year. So this is a big public health problem. The cost to treat Lyme disease patients in the US in 2018 was $9.6 billion. That's an awful lot of money. Um, and a study says that by 2050, 17% of the US population will suffer from chronic Lyme disease. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but that's, that's a horrifying figure. Now the CDC says there's no such thing as chronic Lyme disease and their statistics only count cases in the first couple months of infection. So they're missing an awful lot of people that continue to be sick. They don't end up in the statistics. Studies have shown that up to 63% of patients become chronic sufferers. That's not inevitable. There's ways to prevent that, but that's what happens in, in the reality. So it's not a new disease. We think of it as just having been discovered in Lyme, Connecticut in uh, 1975, but it's actually been around for a long time. It was known in Europe in the 19th century. It was even proposed that it was a tick-borne disease. An early case to, and described in 1922 is the first documented that looks exactly like we see today, but it goes back much farther than that. Some of you may have read about or seen documentaries on this guy they call the Iceman. Uh, he was discovered in 1991, frozen in the Alps. And they've learned an awful lot from analyzing his body, which was very well preserved in the ice. And one of the things they discovered is that he had Lyme disease. And this is not a modern human. He lived in Europe 5,300 years ago. So we know that Lyme goes back at least that far. And here's a, um, a tick that was trapped in amber. Amber, you know, is a tree sap that, um, solidifies into a rock and often traps insects. And it's 15 million years old. And when they drilled into this and took a sample of the blood inside this tick, they discovered it was monkey blood and it had Borrelia burgdorferi, this bacteria that causes Lyme, which was very similar to what we see in Lyme patients today. Very old disease. So what happens when you get it? What are the early symptoms? First of all, the symptoms appear anywhere from two to 30 days after you're infected. Two weeks is probably most typical. Everybody is different. Everybody seems to have very different symptoms, but some things are common to everybody. Uh, because the, the symptoms overlap with so many other things, including COVID, by the way, 
that it's really hard to tell what's wrong with you early in infection. But the early symptoms are flu-like. You know, you get um, flu normally in the colder part of the year. The summer is not considered flu season. And yet people uh, mostly get Lyme disease during the summer. So if you have something that seems like the flu in the summertime, that's very suspicious, especially if you live in the state with the highest number of Lyme disease cases in the country. So most patients first experience things like fatigue, headache, fever, a stiff neck, swollen glands, muscle or bone pain. Same kinds of things you get when you're coming down with the flu or COVID for that matter, and swollen and sore joints. So one thing that can help a little bit to separate Lyme disease symptoms from actual flu or a cold is you usually don't get congested. You don't have the stuffed up nose, the sinus problems that you get with a cold or flu. So something that seems like the flu, but lacks that nasal congestion in the summertime particularly is very suspect. I think most people know what this is. I'm gonna show you a bunch of these so you can see the wide variety of it. This is the bullseye rash, which is characteristic for Lyme disease. It's so characteristic that if you have that um, rash, you have Lyme disease. It is diagnostic, which means that if a doctor looks at that, sees that rash on your body, he can make a diagnosis instantly without any further testing or exam. That's Lyme disease. Unfortunately, it occurs in fewer than half the people that are infected. If you do have that rash, you have Lyme. If you don't have it, you can still have Lyme, but uh, that rash is diagnostic. Now, it varies considerably in appearance, so I'm gonna show you a bunch of them. Here's one that's pretty typical. Um, you know, the characteristic is that there's concentric areas of lighter and darker. And this is actually inflammation caused by the bacteria spreading through your body. For most people, it doesn't itch, uh, it's flat. So most people won't know they have this rash unless they see it. But if you have that rash, you have Lyme disease. Sometimes it just looks like this, which is pretty vague, but that's a Lyme rash, or it could be unmistakable like that. Uh, this is pretty typical. If you have that rash, you have Lyme. It could be less obvious, may look more like that. That's still Lyme disease. Actually, this kind of a rash is probably the most common rash that we see in this area. It doesn't have that bullseye characteristic, at least not easily discerned, but this is a, um, a Lyme rash as, as well. That could be anything, but this actually was a Lyme rash, but that's how it started out. On darker skin, it can be really hard to see. It just looks like a bruise, um, but of course it doesn't hurt and it, it's flat. You can have multiple uh, bullseye rashes that can pop up in different parts of your body. This is another sign of Lyme disease. It's called Bell's palsy, and it causes one half of your face to become paralyzed. And uh, it's a very uncomfortable situation. You can't speak clearly. You can't eat or drink easily. Uh, it's hard to sleep because one eye often won't close properly. And uh, there's theoretically several possible causes for Bell's palsy, including, including a facial injury. But around here, I would suspect that the vast majority of cases of Bell's palsy are actually Lyme disease. It'll go away on its own after a month or two, but that doesn't mean the disease is gone. Some people, it's actually on both sides of their face, but only one side is more typical. So how do you diagnose Lyme disease? Well, first of all, it's important to know that Lyme disease requires a clinical diagnosis. 
This is the old fashioned way of diagnosing what's wrong with you. And in Lyme, it's based on three things, signs, symptoms, and a history of exposure to ticks. Well, we know we're all exposed to ticks because they're very prevalent in our environment. Uh, but signs and symptoms are two other things that make up the clinical diagnosis. Signs are things that a doctor can see or measure. They could be a fever or a swollen joint, something like that that can actually be detected by measurement or observation. Symptoms, on the other hand, are things that you report that probably no one else would know you were experiencing. They would be things like the fatigue, panic attacks, uh, you know, all, all kinds of those um, uh, psychiatric problems. You need to tell your doctor if you're experiencing any of those for, to help him or her make the diagnosis. Now, this is really important too. And I think if everybody walks away from this and doesn't remember anything except this, that is vital. Um, the laboratory tests for Lyme disease are not reliable. I'm not saying that. That's from the CDC and the FDA. They say that the tests for Lyme disease are not reliable and should not be used for making the diagnosis of Lyme disease. Those tests were designed to uh, keep track of the number of cases of Lyme, but they're not sensitive enough to capture every single case. They're good for statistics, but they're not good for diagnosis. So the most common test called an ELISA test is only 30 to 50% sensitive, which means over half the people that are actually infected will have a negative test. So that's not much use. The other important thing to know is the test will always be negative during the first few weeks of infection. That's because the tests are looking for antibodies your body produces in reaction to the infection, just like COVID. When you take an antibody test, it's looking for those antibodies. In Lyme, we're looking for those antibodies as well. But your body hasn't made those antibodies instantly. It takes you know, up to a month or six weeks before you have enough of those antibodies to show up in the test. And even then, it'll miss half of them. So a test given right when you start feeling lousy and for at least a month afterward will always be negative, even if you're infected. So, you know, you go to your doctor, you've got a bullseye rash, he thinks maybe it's Lyme, not understanding that the bullseye rash is diagnostic for Lyme. So he runs a blood test, it comes back negative, either because it just missed you or it was done too early. So doctors will try to find what else is wrong with you to explain your symptoms. And here's a list of common things that Lyme patients are misdiagnosed with when they actually have Lyme disease. And it's interesting to note that of all these different diseases and conditions that you see listed here, none of them have a reliable test and none of them have a known cause. So it's very interesting uh, to speculate that a lot of these things may actually be Lyme disease in disguise. Uh, but these are the things people end up getting diagnosed with and treated for, which doesn't really help because you're not treating the disease, you're treating some other disease the patient probably doesn't have. And if none of those things work, eventually patients are told that there's nothing physically wrong with them. It's all in their head and they have a psychiatric problem. That seems really far-fetched, but we hear it over and over and over again. People are told to see a psychiatrist who prescribes uh, antidepressant drugs, which does, do not help the patient at all, and they continue to be sick. So it's really important to realize that, uh, you know, it's really hard to get the proper diagnosis for this disease. After you've been infected, you do not develop any immunity. You know, if you have COVID, you know, you have immunity for a certain amount of time. It, 
you know, evidently from the, the evidence that um, the protection is gone in, in three or four months, but you have some immunity right away. Other diseases uh, like chicken pox or measles or something like that, uh, for those of us that precede uh, vaccines for those diseases, once we had that disease, we can never get it again. That's lifelong immunity. But in the case of Lyme disease, you can get Lyme over and over from new tick bites. So you don't get any immunity from having the disease. Now, people ask about a vaccine. There was a Lyme vaccine available from 1999 to 2002. It caused harm in about a third of the patients who got that vaccine. It, they developed a pretty much permanent um, arthritis from the vaccine. The protection was very short-lived. Some studies showed that it probably wasn't effective for more than 90 days. And it's important to note that it only protected those people from Lyme disease and not from other tick-borne diseases that we're going to talk about in a minute. So anybody that was vaccinated back then, um, their prote protection is long gone. So how do you treat this disease? Well, it's bacterial disease, so we use antibiotics. Experts recommend four weeks of treatment for a case of Lyme that was diagnosed soon after infection, you know, as soon as you have that bullseye rash or those symptoms, uh, four to eight weeks. And they usually use the doxycycline, uh, doxycycline or amoxicillin, and that results in a 90% cure. So Getting treated right away is really important because you have an excellent chance of beating the disease then and not having any further effects from it. But if you don't treat it early enough or not don't treat it long enough, then it becomes persistent or chronic, and it may require months or even years of treatment. And in that case, intravenous antibiotics are sometimes used, especially if neurolog neurological or cardiac problems are present. And they often use combinations of antibiotics. So treatment is really complex once it gets to that chronic stage. Now that all sounds pretty discouraging, but it's actually worse because a tick, can, a tick bite can give you more than one disease. And it appears that the majority of people that are that get really ill uh, from Lyme actually are also suffering from one of uh, many different tick-borne diseases that the ticks also carry. I'm only going to talk about a few of them. Uh, there are over 20 that have been discovered in the United States, and more are being added all the time. Um, we have most of those in Pennsylvania, not all of them, but I'm gonna talk about a few that, that are very common in our area. One disease is called babesiosis, and it's a malaria-like blood parasite. And in this photograph, you can see uh, taken through a microscope, those are red blood cells. And you can see inside those red blood cells, there's things inside them. And what that is, is that blood parasite. This disease can cause all kinds of problems. It can cause anemia, shortness of breath, extreme fatigue. For somebody with a compromised immune system, it can actually be deadly. So it, because it's not a bacteria that causes this, but actually a parasite, uh, antibiotics don't help this at all. We don't have good treatments for it. They use anti-malarial drugs, and that's the best we found to treat it at this stage. Another one that's very common is called Bartonella. It's also a bacterial disease, uh, but the antibiotics that are used to treat Lyme are not effective with this infection. So you need a different class of antibiotics. It also appears that it's more commonly spread by fleas than ticks. So flea bites can give you this disease more readily than tick bites, but we know ticks carry it as well. This is a, a type of rash that's sometimes seen in patients with Bartonella. Uh, most people don't have a rash, but if you have a rash that looks something like that, that could be an indication of Bartonella. 
Bartonella causes most of the neurological symptoms that are sometimes attributed to Lyme disease. So all those things I talked about earlier may actually be caused by Bartonella. And uh, it, it's, it's a difficult disease to treat because um, most there, there really isn't a totally effective treatment for it. Um, and doctors aren't on the lookout for it. Rocky Mountain spotted fever is fairly rare, but it's actually more common in the Eastern United States than it is in the Rocky Mountains. This can be up to 20% fatal, uh, but most people get so severely ill that they end up hospitalized and are treated for it. And this is a bacterial infection. It's treated with doxycycline. So if you catch it early enough, um, most people recover without any consequences, but it can be deadly. And the last one I'm gonna, well, the next to the last one I'm gonna talk about tonight is called Powassan fever. This is a fairly uncommon disease, but it's important to be aware of it because it's 10 to 20% fatal and there's no treatment available. It's a viral disease. Antiviral drugs seem to have no effect on it. And unfortunately, uh, many people never get a diagnosis and uh, they die within days of becoming bitten with a tick that's carrying this disease. And sometimes this is also called deer tick fever. There's a bunch of very closely related diseases and it's carried by deer ticks, the same ones that carry Lyme. It's been found in every county in Pennsylvania. Some areas of Pennsylvania had up to 93% of the ticks infected with this disease. And as I said, it's 10 to 20% fatal, no treatment, no vaccine. It's a seven to 30 day incubation period. The early symptoms are like so many other things. You can read the list there. Uh, but some things that are uh, particularly characteristic of this disease are encephalitis and inflammation of the brain and meningitis and another brain and nerve inflammation. Uh, you know, with uh, a lot of tick-borne diseases, a tick um, has to be attached for a certain amount of time before you, your chances of getting infected uh, increase to the point where you're likely to be infected. But with Powassan fever, uh, you can become infected within 15 minutes of being bitten by a tick. 91% of the patients uh, develop severe neuroinvasive disease, you know, which can be deadly. But of the 50% of the surviving patients, they have long-term serious health impact. So very serious disease, very scary disease. Uh, so far, it hasn't been real common in our part of the state, but it's obviously spreading. And the last one I'm going to talk about is called alpha-gal meat allergy. This is a really strange one. Um, it's caused by the bite of a, uh, an infected um, lone star tick, which is a fairly common tick in our area now. And when somebody's bitten by this infected tick, they can no longer eat red meat. If they eat beef or pork, uh, they will develop an anaphylactic reaction to it, which can be deadly. And it appears that this reaction continues indefinitely. Some people seem to make a slow recovery and can resume eating meat, but other people, um, it appears, we don't know because it's relatively recently discovered, uh, they will go on perhaps for the rest of their life, lives not being able to eat meat. So the most important thing is prevention, of course. The best thing is to not get this disease or these diseases in the first place. So let's look at who gets Lyme disease. This shows all the species that we know of that are affected by Lyme disease. That's humans, other primates, dogs, horses, cattle, and cats. Um, it's interesting to note that the animals, the wild animals in our environment, like deer, mice, skunks, raccoons, possums, 
they don't get sick from this disease. Only these species do. Uh, so this is the deer tick, highly magnified. This is the adult female deer tick, the largest of them. And I'll show you other pictures that'll give you a better scale of it. But that's what that tick looks like. Here you can see that one, this one we just saw here is uh, comparable to the one in the right there. That's, you know, a small um, animal, but it's big enough that most people will detect it crawling on them, which is good because they'll probably get that tick off of them before it bites them. But the littler one on the left on the, on the uh, fingernail is the nymph stage. And the nymphal stage ticks are the ones that cause most of the infections. And that's because they're really little. Imagine if that tick were on your ankle or in the back of your knee, you probably wouldn't see it. And because the tick is so small, most people don't feel it crawling on them. So most people never know they're bitten. And that's what makes this disease so insidious is because most people never know. They don't see the tick, they never see it, and they just develop symptoms. So we have to be really careful of that nymphal stage. So where are ticks found? Well, they're found in places like this where a field or a yard transitions into the woods. That's where the highest concentrations of ticks are found. Some place like this is the deer trail in the woods. The deer are um, infested with these ticks and we'll go into a little bit more about their life cycle in a minute, but uh, the deer trails are where the most ticks are found. So it looks like a great place to walk in the woods if there's not an established trail, but it can be dangerous as well. Ticks are found in tall grass or um, weeds or brush uh, like this. And they, uh, ticks do not jump, they do not fly. Uh, they're rarely found more than three feet above the ground. So uh, what they do is hide out in a place like this, even in a nice yard, in the places where there's moist uh, areas like under the shrubbery and trees, that's where they're likely to be found. Ticks need moisture to survive. In direct sunlight, they can't survive. So a yard that's in full sun uh, is less likely to have ticks. So how do they find you? They go out on the end of a blade of grass or a twig and they just stand there very passively. Their front legs are long and they're outstretched when they're looking for a meal. By the way, they only eat blood. It's the only thing they do. They only have three meals in their lifetime. And those long legs at the tips of them are covered with barbs that are designed to catch on the fur of an animal your skin or your clothing as you pass by. Uh, so that's how they find you. They just stand out there and wait. And if they don't get a host uh, throughout the summer, they'll go back down to the ground in the leaf litter and wait till the next year. They can actually go a whole year or two without feeding if, if necessary and still come out and uh, find you the next year. Now the white-footed mouse and other small mammals are the reservoir species for Lyme disease. That means they keep the disease in our environment. And if you look closely at this mouse, you can see all those little tiny spots on their ears, on his ears. Those are larval ticks, the first stage of the tick when they're just hatched from an egg. And they feed on this mouse and all the mice are infected with Lyme. They're the reservoir species. We also know chipmunks and voles and, and maybe some others also are reservoir species, but the mouse, the white-footed mouse, which is a common mouse we have in our area, they're the reservoir. They infect those ticks when those ticks are feeding on them. And then those ticks will drop off, transition to the nymphal stage. And that's when they come looking for us. Deer are an important part of the equation because they're called deer ticks 
for a reason. That's because the deer are their preferred hosts. Deer can have up to 3,000 ticks on them. This is a photo taken uh, in uh, Cecil County, Maryland, not all that far from us, adjacent to, to Chester County. And uh, uh, this is a typical uh, deer that, that is found in the wild with all these ticks feeding on this deer. The deer are their preferred host for mating. This is where the male and female uh, deer ticks find each other and mate. Um, but they can be on any of the deer, even these fawns. In fact, uh, occasionally fawns are actually killed by the amount of blood that all these ticks draw from them, feeding on them. So we know that when the deer population is reduced in an area, the tick population crashes a few years later, two years later probably. So one of the keys to preventing Lyme disease is to reduce the tick population. And one great way to reduce the tick population is to reduce the deer population. And I'm sure many of you have experienced deer in your yard <clears throat> or in your neighborhood. And uh, we actually have more deer in Pennsylvania now than we did before Pennsylvania was colonized. And we've created a great um, environment for them which you know, I feel bad about because it's not the deer's fault, but um, they are spreading this disease to humans through the ticks that, that are fed on them, breed on them. Now let's look at how dangerous our environment is. If we go from um, this calendar, which starts at January on the left and December on the right, and you see that the uh, danger of getting infected is highest just about now and through the rest of the summer. That's when you're most likely to encounter ticks and be bitten. Another interesting thing about this graph shows that this time of the year, the nymph will stage. The nymphs are most common, which means those are the ones you can't feel crawling on you. So not only are, are this the most dangerous time, but you're exposed to the most dangerous life stage of the ticks. You also notice that the risk never drops to zero. The cold weather does not kill ticks. They can go through the winter just fine. And uh, so even in January or February, when it could be 20 degrees or much lower out, there can still be ticks that can be active on a sunny day. So knowing what you know now about tick habitat, uh, does this look like a good idea? You know, we have to say, no, that looks very dangerous to me. Um, is this a good idea? Hunters are, a, I mean, it's a good thing that he got his deer for the hunter. And, uh, you know, it's one less deer to spread Lyme disease ticks. But um, he's standing there, kneeling there next to a, a deer that was just killed. And that deer body is now cooling down. The ticks are no longer have a blood supply to feed on. So they're going to go to look for another host. And hunters are ex really high risk for Lyme, not only from their contact with deer, but just from being in the environment. So I do a lot of education for hunters and um, the, most of them are being very good about taking proper precautions. So how do you protect yourself? Uh, well, the experts recommend you wear long pants, long sleeve shirts, pants tucked into your socks, wear a hat, use permethrin spray on your clothing or DEET on your skin. We'll talk about those in a minute. Now, that type of protection doesn't sound very comfortable in hot weather, and it's not. And it's predicted that we're going to have 90 degree days on Saturday and Sunday this weekend. So that's hard to do. Nobody likes being all covered over uh, in that kind of heat, but it's really important to stay safe to do that. Now, here are some insect repellent options. The ones that contain DEET are the two on the left. Uh, you know, they're typically found in products like uh, OFF, which a lot of people are familiar with. 
uh, the deep works by evaporating off your skin and repelling insects. They just don't like that chemical. Uh, DEET has been around since the early 1950s. It's generally pretty safe, but it is a neurotoxin and it's probably not really a great idea to use on children, especially little kids that might have DEET on their fingers and then put their fingers in their mouth. Probably a risk that's a little more than most parents or grandparents would like to take. Uh, the other thing about deep based products is that because they work on evaporation, the protection doesn't last very long. So it could be as little as an hour or two on a hot day, especially if you're active and sweaty and, and working hard, that causes the deep to, to evaporate pretty quickly. So if you're gonna be out for a period of time, you need to take that repellent with you and keep reapplying it. The, the second from the left there, the one called Ultrathon, was developed originally for the military uh, because it's, it lasts about 12 hours. So that's probably a better uh, choice than the ones that you spray on or spread on uh, because the Ultrathon will last a lot longer. For children and for people that don't like putting those kinds of chemicals on their skin. Uh, there's two on the right that are natural based, made from um, uh, various ingredients like a wild tomato and things like that. They are just as effective as DEET and you know maybe a better choice, especially for children. The best way to avoid being bitten by a tick is to use permethrin treated clothing. Now, permethrin is a substance that was synthesized uh, based on a chemical found in chrysanthemums that was found to repel and kill uh, insects and ticks. So it's pretty indiscriminate. It'll kill any insect or any tick, spiders, mosquitoes, anything that gets on you. Now, permethrin itself can't be used on your skin. It doesn't work that way. The, the proper way to use permethrin is to put it on your clothing. And you can do this yourself. It's easy to find permethrin in some of the big box stores, uh, nature's garden centers, places like that. You spray the clothing, hang it up while you're spraying it, get it good and saturated, let it dry completely. And then you have protection for a couple months from that clothing. And, uh, and that can be washed a couple of times before it has to be retreated. A better approach, in, in my opinion, and on a lot of other people, is to use clothing that was permanently treated. And this actually binds the permethrin to the fabric, and they guarantee it through 70 washings. And 70 washings is usually pretty much the, the whatever your a garment is, is going to be worn out by then. So it's, it could be considered to be good for the life of the garment. Actual tests have shown that after 100 washings, it's only lost 1% of its effectiveness. And this stuff is very benign. It doesn't seem to have any effect on people. Uh, some people report that they're extremely sensitive to it and they can't wear the clothing, but uh, we find that that's extremely rare. This a process of permanently treating these, this clothing was originally developed for the military who now uses it and has for about 20 years on all their field uniforms to protect their personnel when they're out in tick habitat. Insect Shield is one company that, that we know is a very reliable source for this clothing. And I'll, I'll give you information about that at the end. Um, Insect Shield also well, can treat your own clothing. So if you have a uniform or a set of clothing that you really like and you want to have that treated, you can have them treat it. It's just as good as the same process they use in the clothing, 70 to 100 washings. So what happens when you come in from out in tick habitat? No matter how well protected you are, it's still a good idea to do a tick check. And 
ideally with another person. Um, what we recommend is that you come in, take off your clothes, and we'll tell you how to take uh, uh, rid your clothing of ticks in a minute. But the first step is to take a shower because if any ticks have not attached to you, they can be washed off at that stage. And even if they are attached, you know, in the process of washing yourself, you may detect them on, on you or even see them if they're big enough. Check your hairline and wear clothes fit tightly. That's where ticks tend to attach. If you find a tick, you remove it promptly the proper way. And we're gonna talk about that in more detail in a minute. Uh, you know, you'll read or hear references that say that a tick has to be attached to you for 24 hours, 48 hours, uh, even 72 hours before you can become infected. Well, that's based on studies that found that by 48 to 72 hours in mice, every single mouse was infected. So we know that you'll get the disease if they're attached that long. But we know that uh, tick-borne disease can be transmitted rather quickly. So we don't know what the period of time of safety is, but I think it's safe to assume that any length of time that a tick is attached to you is dangerous. And you know, how do you know exactly when that tick attached anyway? So there's old wives tales about removing ticks using petroleum jelly, uh, alcohol, dishwashing detergent, or a match or a cigarette to make the tick detach from you. And those things will do that. But in the process, you've irritated the tick to the point where they regurgitate everything that's in them right into your blood. And that increases your chances of infection greatly. You may wanna save the tick uh, in a plastic bag. And, uh, and then the next step is to check with your doctor because many doctors will just um, phone in a, a, a prescription for doxycycline or amoxicillin right away, just to make sure you don't get Lyme disease. Now, for removing ticks, it's important to do it the right way. Uh, the two best ways to do it are with fine pointed tweezers, like in the right, or with a tick removal tool, like you see on the left. The important thing is that when you find a tick on you, is not do not panic. I mean, everybody's first reaction is to grab that thing with their fingers or scrape it out with their fingernail or otherwise get it off you as quickly as possible. That's a bad idea because that increases your chances of infection. So it's much more important to remove it properly. So if you use tweezers, uh, don't grab the tick by the body of the tick because that's just like squeezing it with your fingers. You need to grab it down close to the skin at the head of the tick and then pull it straight out. A better approach is to use a tick removal tool, which are you know, available all kinds of places. Uh, drugstores, pharmacies, places like that all have these tools usually on display. It's a flat piece of metal with a groove in it. You slide it under the tick and it removes it very quickly and very safely. This shows you how to grab the tick with tweezers or with a tool. Either way, that's a safe way to remove a tick. Don't grab it with your fingers, whatever you do. Amazingly, washing clothes does not kill ticks, even with hot water. So when you come in from being outside, we recommend you take your clothing and put it in the dryer and run it on high heat for an hour or so, half hour if, if it's dry. And that will kill them because they can't stand being dried out. That's uh, lethal to ticks, but they can survive going through the wash. So you may have to dry them, run them through the dryer first, then wash them, then dry them again. But then you'll know that the ticks, any ticks that were on your clothing have been killed. Now, Lyme disease and these other diseases are highly controversial. And I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail on this, but you need to know that there's two standards of care. And I'm not gonna go through these for sake of time, but 
it's just important to remember that like many diseases, there's two schools of thought on this. And a lot of doctors do not diagnose properly and do not treat properly. So here are the important things to remember. You get Lyme disease from a tick bite, maybe other insects, other diseases from fleas, but a tick bite's the most common root. It can cause permanent disability. People are, you know, uh, permanently disabled by this disease if they're not properly treated. The blood tests are very unreliable. They miss over half the people that are infected. They won't be have a positive blood test in the first month or so after they're infected. However, the bullseye rash is diagnostic for Lyme. If you have that rash, you have Lyme disease. Short-term treatment of a day or two or even 10 days does not always work. Uh, many people get more than just Lyme disease from a tick bite. So it's important to be evaluated for multiple tick-borne diseases and that requires an expert. And you should be properly protected every time you're in tick habitat. Uh, it's very important. And it's also important to know that this disease is very controversial. The research into it has been really totally underfunded for decades, and we need a lot more research to develop better diagnostic tests and better drugs to treat it. For more information, here are a couple of resources. There's a documentary film called Under Our Skin, which gives very good information on um, uh, Lyme disease and, and other tick-borne diseases, and a book called Cure Unknown, uh, which describes one family's experience uh, getting Lyme disease and being eventually properly treated for it and recovering. And our organization, LymeBasics.org, has a website with lots of good, uh, reliable information you can access. It also has links to our Facebook page. And if you um, are interested in keeping up to date, you can uh, uh, like our Facebook page and uh, receive updates on the latest news on Lyme. And if you need help answering your questions or finding a doctor, we have this hotline number. And uh, one of our experts on our board of directors will help you answer questions and uh, direct you to good sources of reliable treatment. And with that, I'll turn it back to Mark, who can tell us about any questions we have from the audience. Uh, nothing has come in, uh, Doug, but uh, that was that was wonderful, very thorough, and extremely scary. <laughs> um, but it's important that that information gets out there. Does anyone have any questions for Doug? Either unmute yourself or type it in the chat, please. Well, I can only assume that I was so thorough that I answered every question, but I'm, I'm sure people have questions. Noreen says, very informative. Thank you. Thank you, Noreen. Yeah, thank you, Noreen. I see one in the chat there, Mark. Yeah, that's that's Noreen's. Okay. I left okay. somebody. Bird, can birds carry it is a question. Uh, you know, that's a really interesting question because we know the ticks are often spread by birds because the ticks will get on the bird and for migrating birds that helps to spread those ticks and the diseases they carry around the country. So that's a good question. Um, we don't find that they are documented as a reservoir species, but they're certainly effective in spreading the ticks around. Anyone else? Okay, well with that, I guess we will call it a night. Doug, thanks so much for the presentation and uh, sharing all this information with us. Uh, it was my pleasure, Mark, and, and thank you for, to the people that uh, came here to see it and um, you're archiving this to make it available so uh, other people can benefit from it. Uh, Definitely beyond the audience we had tonight. So I appreciate the opportunity and everybody stay, stay safe out there.
All right. You too, Doug. Best to you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight, Dan. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs>